So uh, Darcy Rapucci, okay, is um, from my new hometown now, Hopkinton. Um, she's a Massachusetts native and went out to the University of Colorado for college and originally started her journey thinking that she wanted to be a speech therapist. Um, through uh, that, she decided that maybe audiology was a better fit and that she'd be able to um, help more people. So Darcy has an undergraduate degree in communication disorders from the University of Colorado at Boulder and then has a master's um, in a uh, degree in audiology from Northeastern University in 2006. Uh, Darcy's worked for various ENT practices and done fellowships here in Boston. But most recently, she's opened her own private practice in Hopkinton called Bay State Audiology. Um, Darcy likes to offer a variety of audiology services, mainly for adults. Um, but she is uh, here to help us and um, walk us through some options that are available and things that parents need to know that I am clueless on, like how to interpret an audiogram. <laughs> so um, stick around. We have five different hearing aids if people would like to... Uh, Sample, sample, is that the right word? Demo. Demo, them, Demo. Um, To see uh, what's, what's available and what's out there. So um, I'm going to hand it off to Darcy. Hi, I'm happy to be here to, um, to talk with you guys and, and educate you a little bit about hearing loss in general. I know um, it's something that comes up for a lot of you. So I'm happy to answer questions um, either as I go along or you can save them for at the end. There are a few slides that aren't completely relevant to, um, to Nori disease, so I might jump ahead through a few of those, but I'm going to really focus on, you know, what type of hearing aids are available, um, more of the basics to give you guys an idea so that you know what you're getting into um, when you're out there. Uh, so, like Allison said, I'm a licensed audiologist. Um, I'm certified by the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association. I got my undergrad degree in speech therapy um, at the University of Colorado, and then I got my master's in audiology. So I have a little bit of um, more extensive background in terms of understanding the speech aspects of things as well. Um, I spent five years at the Cambridge Health Alliance uh, working with ENTs, and then I did some retail at BJ's Hearing Center and then opened my own practice in November of 2016. So today, um, what we're going to talk about is overall hearing education, so the anatomy of the ear, where some of these things are coming from, how to read an audiogram, and some of the effects of hearing loss. So some of the signs to look for, um, you know, withdrawal and um, not being parts of conversation, stepping away from things, you know, some of that type of things to help you kind of figure out if this might be starting to occur. We'll also briefly talk about hearing preservation um, and then hearing aids. So in general, in the general population, three in 10 people over age 60 have hearing loss. In comparison to that, 23% also, 23% um, of the population have diabetes. So more people in that age range have hearing loss than diabetes. Um, one in six baby boomers have has a hearing problem. It affects people of all ages, and this is the most important thing that people don't understand. What I come into contact with a lot is that they don't realize that um, it affects everyone. Everyone is affected by hearing loss. And I know that the statistic is that 30% of people with Nori disease have sensory neural hearing loss at some point, but I know Allison was saying she's not sure if that's actually real, <laughs> true or accurate. Yeah, it might be a little bit more than that, so. Um, again, children and infants, I've done um, lots of brain stem testing. So, so you can have testing done on children at a very young age. They, it's not the standard audiogram that they would do in a booth. You would want to do it at um, a pediatric audiology office or in conjunction with a hospital. Um, I've done some here at Mass Ioneer when I was in grad school, um, and it's brainstem testing. So they, you know, hook the baby up with electrodes, and they can tell at that point if there is hearing loss. Um, again, you know, this is kind of how people are affected. Obviously, it affects people as they get older. 
but you can have it across the whole spectrum of ages. So this is, I think, what's gonna be a little bit more important for you guys. Um, this is the ear. And uh, on the screen, you can see the external auditory canal, which is your ear canal, um, and then you have your eardrum, and then the bones of the middle ear space, which lead into the cochlea, and then from the cochlea, the sound goes up through the nerves into the brain. Um, for nori disease, the main focus is gonna be the inner ear um, and, and the cochlea, because they think that the stria vascularis, which is part of the cochlea, is what's affected by um, nori disease. The outer ear and middle ear may come into play for a child that gets diagnosed with hearing loss. Um, those are where you would have more ear infections and things like that. Um, if they do need tubes or something, that would happen in the eardrum. Um, so that might be where you start if they get hearing loss as a child, but then as they get the more um, common type for nori disease, it would be in the inner ear because it's sensory neural. So um, these are the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells. And you can see that um, the outer hair cells are these V-shaped um, functions. This is what's affected for a lot of people as they get older or in terms of noise-induced hearing loss, these are the, the parts of the ear that we would look at. They're very small. The only way they can actually study these hair cells is after someone has died and they take the temporal bone and they um, study it that way, which is very similar to how they learn about the stria vascularis. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing the inner uh, or outer hair cells because it's not relevant to the um, nori disease hearing loss, but I just wanted to give you an idea of this is what they look like when they're magnified. Um, they're very small, similar to the stria vascularis, which is, you know, it's hard to study it. I know at Mass Eye and Ear they have a temporal bone um, lab where people donate their temporal bones. Um, and so that's where they're probably doing some of the research for this. So I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, this is again, inner hair cells and outer hair cells that are healthy and damaged inner and outer hair cells. And this happens as you get older with exposure to noise, things like that. But I'm not going to focus my talk on this. So now um, what's up on the screen is a typical audiogram. This is a blank audiogram. It is, um, go, I'm going to use it to just show you what it looks like. Um, at the very top of the audiogram is the softest sounds that you can hear, and at the very bottom of the audiogram are the loudest sounds. So what we do when we're doing a hearing test is we, we will start out at a normal level and we'll go up until they can hear it and then we go down until they can hear it and we get kind of the average of what they're hearing, the, the softest sound that they're able to hear and that's what we take a graph of. Um, so for some people it comes in you know, much higher. I have an audiogram on here I can show you. Um, for others, you know, for normal hearing, it would be anywhere up above 20 dB, so very close to the top of the graph, whereas for someone with a more severe loss, it's closer to the bottom. Um, at 90 dB, anything below 90 dB is considered a profound loss, and they're considered deaf. Um, on the bottom of the graph is the frequencies. So it goes from 125 hertz out to 8,000 hertz. And the reason that we test that specific range is because that's the range that's focused on speech. Above 8,000, um, you can't, most, some audiometers will test it, not all do, um, but you don't really worry about that because it's not speech centered. Um, musicians might be more concerned about it, but for everyone else, it's, it's 250 to 8,000 hertz. So now on the audiogram, I have superimposed um, a hearing 
loss and um, what's called the speech banana, and it also lists the different levels of hearing loss. So I'm going to talk about each one a little bit. Um, so for this individual, um, the red circles, this is important, when you're looking at an audiogram, the red circles are always the right ear. The blue X's are always the left ear. And the reason that that is important is because hearing aids are the same way. Red is right, blue is left. So when you're looking at anything related to the ear, red is right, blue is left. Um, so if you're helping you know, a, a family member with their hearing aids or your son, um, what you'll be doing is the right is the red, the red ear. It, the right <laughs> is red, the left is blue. Um, on here, the speech banana are all of these letters, and this is showing you the frequencies that these letters um, happen at and the level at which they happen. So, for example, P is coming in at about 1,500 hertz at 20 decibels. So for someone who has hearing loss down in this 50 decibel range, P is a whisper for them. This is not something that you will always see on an audiogram in the audiologist's office. You can find the speech banana online so you can see some of the sounds that they're starting to miss. Um, or you can ask the audiologist to show you the speech banana. Some of this stuff, um, you have to do a little bit more advocating. Some audiologists don't always show this type of information, but it's there. If you want it, you can ask for it. And that's why I, I think Allison was happy to find me because I find that I'm more about education, and so I spend time, and my first visit with my patients is always at least an hour so that I can go over all of this with them, because I think it's very important for you to know. Um, as you go through, you can see, like I said, anything above 20 decibels closer to the top of the audiogram is normal hearing. From 20 to 40 decibels is the mild hearing range. 40 to 70 is moderate, 70 to 90 decibels is severe, and then anything above 90 is considered profound. These are all the air conduction scores. So that's what we're looking at on this audiogram is air conduction scores. And that's when they're listening with the headphones on or insert earphones and they're hearing the beeping. There's two different parts to an audiogram. There's the air conduction scores, and then there's um, word recognition, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, again, this slide just talks about the different levels of hearing loss. Normal is 0 to 20. Mild is 21 to 40 decibels. Moderate, moderate to severe, severe and profound. So the word recognition scores, um, these are very important, and they don't always go over these with patients when they give the results. I've had a few people come in to see me as a second opinion, and they had never known what their word understanding scores were. Um, this is important for Nori disease because the patients that they've tested, um, I was reading Dr. Halpin's work, and the patients they've tested have had great word understanding. And this is important because with good word understanding, it means good benefit from hearing aids. If the word understanding gets down below 50%, then um, patients tend not to do as well with hearing aids because what the hearing aids do is make everything louder, but they don't make it clearer. The clarity is something that happens in the brain. So it's important when you first start to notice hearing loss to get the hearing tested and to, um, to, to get hearing aids. Uh, because over time, on the last slide with the audiogram that had the speech banana, over time what will happen is um, as your brain is deprived of some of that stimulation for those sounds, it will start to forget what those sounds sound like. And then the hearing aids don't help as much because they're not able to um, to the brain isn't able to, to understand the words once it's hearing them. And it's trying to pick the words out of the background noise and everything else. So it's great that for patients with Nori disease, they do still have good word understanding because they should get benefit from the hearing aids.
Okay, so um, like I said, on the audiogram, we looked at um, that patient particularly had normal hearing. There are three different types of hearing loss. There's sensory neural loss, which is what most patients with Norrie disease have. There's conductive hearing loss, which is if you have wax that's blocking your ear and it's an easy fix, they'll just clean the wax out. Um, or for children that have ear infections, um, they have a conductive hearing loss and they'll get tubes and then the hearing loss will go away. It's usually something that's fixed by surgery um, or you know, removal of wax or something like that. With a mixed hearing loss, you have a little bit of both. So for a child with Norrie disease, they could end up with a little bit of a mixed loss where they have the sensory neural component from the Norrie disease, and then um, the, if they had an ear infection or something like that, the conductive component. So for them, they would be followed and eventually, hopefully, get um, the hearing aids program for just the Norrie disease, but once the, the conductive component was cleared. So this is a typical noise-induced hearing loss, but I know looking at Dr. Halpin's research um, with Norrie disease patients that there are some patients that have a similar type of hearing loss. And for this um, type, for, for someone with, sorry, for someone with um, Norrie disease, it's important, or for anyone with hearing loss, it's important to have your hearing tested every one to two years. Once you have a diagnosed loss, it's important to make sure that it's not changing. You want to follow the pure tone scores, but you also want to follow the word understanding to make sure that that's not getting worse. Most, um, all hearing aids nowadays are programmable. So as your hearing changes, we can hook you back up to the computer and adjust the hearing aids. So in a year or two, if your hearing is decreasing, you want to make sure the hearing aids are getting more volume. At any point, um, when you have hearing aids, if you're starting to notice that you're not hearing as well, you should go back to your audiologist. Part of the cost of the hearing aid is care for the life of the hearing aid in most situations. They're starting to kind of bundle programs now where you pay for the hearing aid at a lower rate and then, you know, buy service plans. But in most places, when you purchase a hearing aid, if you're buying it directly from the audiologist or the center, what you're paying for is the hearing aid, but care in that office. So any cleanings, any repairs, any, um, any services that you need that can take place in that office should be covered. There should be no extra charge, and you should go in and take advantage of that. Not every audiologist will tell you to come in every year, but I think it's important for you to know that you should. Um, like I said to my patients, I, I send out reminder cards every one to two years to come back in for a hearing test, um, and any point you have a problem, come back in. Um, so now this slide is showing some of the um, effects of hearing loss, some of the, you know, in terms of communication. You might hear everyone mumbles. Um, they'll have difficulty when there's a lot of background noise. You might find that they're leaning in towards you. Um, the distortion of speech is something that might be hard for, for some people to articulate, but you know, again, it's that not fully understanding and kind of the mumbling. They might say that everyone's mumbling. Um, or they start asking what a lot, um, you know, putting their ear in. People don't realize it, that they do it, but um, everyone lip reads. I have a lot of my patients that come in, and when I tell them they have hearing loss, they get very upset, and they say, I don't know how to lip read, but everyone does it. And as your hearing progresses, you do it more. Um, in general, most people don't do anything about hearing loss for at least five to seven years from the time that they're diagnosed. And in that time, your brain is learning to adapt on its own to, to make up for it. Some of the psychosocial um, effects of hearing loss are that people start to withdraw. Um, you know, they can't hear and they avoid those situations. They get anxiety, um, reduced self-esteem, and they just they, they withdraw from everything. So it's important to get hearing aids so that you can be a part of it. It's, it's really a better quality of life. 
Um, again, you know, for the general population, these are the things, depression, anxiety, um, paranoia. I had a one woman at a senior center when I gave this talk, and she came up to me and said the same thing. She was like, I found that, you know, she had some heart issue, and she was starting to withdraw from everything, and she recognized that her hearing was also starting to go, so she wanted to do something about it. Um, so the effects of untreated hearing loss, like I said before, um, this really comes into terms, the, the slide is saying that it starves the auditory centers of the brain of acoustic information, and um, if patients wait too long, the hearing aids may not have as much benefit. So I have a feeling that if you took um, your family member or loved one to the doctor and they had hearing loss, you would want to do something about it. In the general population, like I said, they wait five to seven years on average before they do anything about it. And so I might have a patient that came in with 85% word understanding, and then five years later they come in and they're already down at 70%. There's no way to predict how quickly hearing loss will progress. Um, it does progress over time, so it's very important that once you find out, you do something about it to try to maintain whatever good hearing is still there. So this is a slide um, that I think is important. Um, when you are going to see anyone about your hearing, you want to make sure that you're seeing the appropriate person. Um, like I said, I am an audiologist. Uh, I graduated 12 years ago with my master's. I was the last class in the United States that could graduate with their master's. After that, everyone was required to have a doctor of audiology. Um, we do, uh, at that point, the, the master's program was a two-year academic program followed by what's called a clinical fellowship year. During the academic program, you work in multiple centers, um, private practices, hospitals. That's how I was at Mass Eye and Ear. And you learn how to perform everything. And you work with patients, and that's how you get your experience. Um, with the master's program, it's, I think, three years of instruction. And then it's still the clinical fellowship year where you're working under a mentor um, who's helping you. We are trained in the diagnosis and treatment of many disorders of the ear. Um, working at Cambridge Hospital in the ENT department, I found tumors in the ear. Um, I found mastoids in the middle ear space. You know, there was a lot of things that I saw that were very interesting. The other place that you can go is a hearing instrument specialist. They're going to be at Miracle Ear. They're going to be at Bell Tone. Um, they're going to be in some of those places. Um, there are some hearing instrument specialists that are very good at what they do. However, all they are required to have is a three-month certificate um, and a high school diploma. They pass a licensing exam, and their main purpose is to fit hearing aids. So when they do a hearing test, they're not necessarily always doing the word understanding, which is very important. Um, they don't sometimes do bone conduction, which I didn't talk about. Um, it's similar to the air conduction scores. We put a different transponder on, a headband, and it sits on the bone behind the ear. And what that does is it um, lets us know if the hearing loss is sensory neural or conductive. And that's not always performed by a hearing instrument specialist. Um, so my big plug is no matter where you go, make sure you're seeing an audiologist who will get better care in, for the most part. Um, and they're really trained to, to help the disorders of the ear, not just to fit a hearing aid. So this I'm going to skip over. I, I took out the other slides, not that one. Some of the other effects of hearing loss. So along with hearing loss, you aren't hearing as well. Um, you know, conversations are, are distorted or mumbled or, or just slightly less. But you can also have other conditions. Um, tinnitus is ringing in your ear. 
I have not seen um, in the research that I was able to do on hearing loss associated with Nori disease how prevalent these are, but I wanted to talk about them just in case. Um, so tinnitus is ringing in the ear. Sometimes um, hearing aids will help. Unfortunately, there is no known cure for tinnitus. There are a lot of um, things out there that you can do for tinnitus. I don't know how accurate any of them are. Um, people have tried different enzymes or different, you know, um, vitamins that are supposed to be good cures. There is not a known cure. So you can spend your money on those things, but it doesn't necessarily mean it will help. Sometimes hearing aids will help. Just by putting on a hearing aid, you're bringing up the background noise of the people around them, and sometimes that's enough to get rid of it. Um, some people find that they only have the ringing in their ears at night, and so they sleep with a white noise machine or a fan so that they can sleep at night. Um, the other thing that you can do with hearing aids for tinnitus is that a lot of the manufacturers have programs that are designed just for tinnitus. So you would have a regular program on the hearing aid, and then you would have their, their tinnitus program. And what that does is it puts in white noise similar to a fan. With that, I say it puts in white noise, but there are different sounds that you can hear through the hearing aids. And the reason that that is important is because you should work with the audiologist to find the sounds that work best to get rid of the ringing for the patient. So if they're able to communicate and say, oh, you know, that's it, that works, it will help to get rid of that ringing for them. Um, hyperacusis is sensitivity to sound. So there are some people that as their hearing gets worse, they also get more sensitive to sound. And they're very difficult to fit with hearing aids because they usually have a limit at which sound is too loud, whereas you have, you know, their hearing loss goes down to here and you need to give them volume so that they're able to hear, but you can't give them too much because then their ears get very sensitive. So there is a fine line sometimes for a patient with hyperacusis. Um, I'm not sure how relevant it is for Nori disease, but there are just people in the general population who also have sound sensitivity issues. And um, I work with one woman who's 32. She has normal hearing, but she's very sensitive to sound. And so she wears hearing aids to act as a masker to get rid of some of that noise that is troublesome to her. Um, she has the white noise in all the time, and it helps her to be able to function better in her life. Um, I don't know, like I said, how relevant that is, but I wanted to make you aware that it is an option if you find that someone is sensitive to sound. Um, and diplocusis is hearing one frequency but at a different sound than it really is, and that's not as common. It's mostly the hyperacusis or the tinnitus that are, are the most common complaints associated with hearing loss. This is my quick slide about hearing preservation. Um, obviously, noise exposure is not the main cause of hearing loss associated with Nori disease, but I think it's important to talk about because um, you know that hearing loss may be coming, and just for everyone in general, hearing loss is something that, you know, everyone's exposed to a lot of noise. You want to make sure that you're protecting whatever hearing, residual hearing you have so it doesn't get worse. Because um, you could have, you know, a mild, flat sensory neural loss that with noise exposure could get worse. Um, and the reason that I think this slide is important is because you can see um, noise inside. So the OSHA standard for workers is 85 dB of noise for eight hours. Anything over that, they need to wear hearing protection. Um, as you go up in noise exposure, the amount of time that you can be exposed to it becomes shorter. So if you're at a rock concert where it's 110 dB, you should only be exposed to that without hearing protection for 15 minutes. So it goes up very quickly um, in terms of noise. I actually have on my phone a little sound level meter. I bring it around with me places and I'll, you know, bars get very loud, restaurants get very loud. Movie. I, I haven't been to the movies in a long time because I've got three small children, but, um, but I'm sure they're also very loud. 
So, um, so these are all things just to be um, aware of. And there are different forms of hearing protection. You know, the standard foam plugs. Most people find that they're not comfortable. My kids all have their own set of earmuffs that they wear for fireworks or concerts and things like that. Um, then you can get custom products and musicians' earplugs, which you don't need to worry about. But, um, but you want to make sure that there is exposure to loud noise to protect the residual hearing so that it doesn't get worse. Okay, so when selecting the right type of hearing aid, I know this is important for a lot of people, um, what we look at is the degree of loss and what style may be appropriate, as well as what those patients do. Are they mostly at home? Are they by themselves? Are they exposed to um, group settings? Are they working? How active are they? Are they outside a lot? These are all considerations to take into account when we're looking at the style of hearing aid. A few quick slides of older style hearing aids from the 1930s and 50s. Um, this is the vacuum tube hearing aid. I've given this presentation a bunch of times and I'm not actually sure how all of these worked. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> Let me go back, sorry. Um, so the vacuum tube hearing aid was basically a, a, a box that has a speaker on the front of it. And the box is probably five to six inches big. And then it has um, a wire that would go up to your ear with a little earbud. And it only had one. So I assume you would put it in the ear that was worse. Um, and then on top of that, it has two little um, tubes beside it that I believe are some sort of chemical that work together. Again, I'm not exactly sure how these ones worked <laughs> and how they produce sound, but it was the start to what we have today. And that's why I think it's important so you can see how far they really have come in terms of um, hearing aids. So this next slide is also from the 1930s, and this is a hearing aid camera, um, which it looks, you know, like a very old metal camera. And on the front, there are five um, little inset spaces that might be speakers. I'm not sure. I, I don't know if you would carry this around beside your ear or, or what. Um, and beside that, there's a picture of an old leather purse um, with what looks like a very old type of cell phone, maybe. It's, it's some sort of a metal box. And again, I'm not sure <laughs> how these worked for hearing, but this is what there was back in the 30s. Um, and then in the 50s, in the 1950s, they had the hearing aid tie clip, which again um, would go on a tie. It was probably a three-inch little um, clip for the tie. And it looks like it has a little bit of a speaker on it, so it must have amplified the sound somehow. But I don't see any part that would have been on the ear. So again, I'm not sure how these worked. The um, hearing aid barrettes, there are four different ones. And they're a thicker barrette. Um, and they look like they would be close enough to the ear that you would be able to hear with them. But I'm not sure. Then you went to eyeglass hearing aids, which were, um, on the slide, there's a picture of two sets of glasses. One of them, the hearing aid is actually built into the temple piece that goes behind the ear. And the other one, it's built into the temple, and there's a wire coming down with a little earbud that would have gone into the ear. Um, I have not seen those. However, I have seen the other picture up there, which is called a body aid. This is a, um, I haven't seen it in a very long time. It was when I first started practicing about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, and it's a little, probably three to four inch um, box, almost like a, an older Walkman that you would have fit into your pocket. And that would have been the microphone for the sound. And then it has a little wire with another piece that comes up to your ear. Um, this one particularly only has one wire, but I think that there were some body aids that had two wires, so you could put it into both ears. Um, so those aren't that outdated. That, you know, the body aid I have seen in my practice in the past 12 years.
So on this slide, um, what this is showing is some of the more common hearing aid styles nowadays. Um, on the top, there's something called the in the ear or a full shell hearing aid, and it basically takes up the entire space inside the concha of your ear. They get smaller from there to a half shell, which is just taking up um, half of that concha space. The in the canal, which is really only taking up from the front of your ear canal into the space and the completely in the canal, which is a very small hearing aid that sits just mostly inside the canal. You can really only see the faceplate from it um, if, if you're looking at someone's ear. These are custom made. Um, so what happens is the audiologist puts a little cotton dome in and takes an impression of the ear, sends it out to the manufacturer, and then the hearing aid is sent back. All of the components of the hearing aid are inside those um, those custom products. So if there's a repair or something like that, we have to send it back to the manufacturer to get it fixed, which means that you can be without the hearing aid for up to a week or two, depending on how long that can take. Um, on the bottom of the slide, there is the standard behind the ear hearing aid, which is the larger piece that goes behind the ear with a piece of tubing that comes down to an ear mold that fits into the ear space. Um, and beside that, there's something called the open ear mini behind the ear, which also has an open tube that comes down to a little dome that goes inside the earpiece, and it has a smaller um, piece that goes behind the ear. Again, these are what the custom hearing aids look like not in the ear. Um, you can see that the full shell is bigger, and that's the one that takes up the whole earpiece. The half shell is a little bit smaller. You can see the ear canal on a lot of these, um, which has a bend to it. So everyone's ears bend. Um, there's two bends in your ear canal. Usually it kind of goes back and then back forward. Um, so the best way, if you're helping someone to put their hearing aid on, if you're having trouble putting it into the ear space, the best way to do that is to lift up on the ear, um, up on the top of the pinna, on the top of the ear, and that will straighten out the ear canal. So you'll be able to more easily slide the earpiece into the ear um, to get it into place. Once you have that straight and you put it in, you can let go and it should conform to their ear. Um, this slide is showing the standard behind the ear hearing aid. It's a little bit bigger. It has a clear tube that comes down to usually a clear ear mold that fits into the ear. So the next slide is showing the different types of um, the newest form of hearing aid, the newest style of hearing aid. is called the receiver in the canal. They are a smaller body that fits behind the ear. Inside the tubing is actually wires that come down to the receiver, which is where the sound is amplified from. So it's not all contained within the hearing aids for this one. The, um, the good thing about that is that typically the part of the hearing aid that breaks first is the receiver. The receiver on these is very easily replaceable. And when I do the demo later, I can show you how quickly that can change. Um, so it's a five-minute visit to the audiologist to repair a receiver in the canal hearing aid usually versus two weeks without the hearing aid um, with a custom product. The other nice thing about the receiver in the canal hearing aids is that as the hearing loss progresses, we can change the receiver and give more volume just by changing that tubing. Um, it can go from a mild loss all the way up to severe to profound. So it makes the hearing aid much more flexible. Hearing aids typically last only five to six years. Um, with these receiver in the canal hearing aids, I've been finding that they've been lasting my patients about seven to eight years. Um, then they usually end up coming in because the hearing aids stop working and there's newer technology that is much better. Um, so they've become a little bit more flexible so that they're not, with the custom products, if the hearing loss progresses, you really are stuck getting a new one um, 
in a few years if it changes quickly. Um, and this is a graph that shows that. So uh, the red line on the top of the graph is showing that it used to be that not a lot of people wanted these behind the hear hearing aids, but it has steadily grown over time so that now most of the hearing aids are considered behind the ear because they're this receiver in the canal style. Um, the custom products are actually going down in terms of popularity. Um, a lot of people are also concerned about people seeing their hearing aids and so the receiver and canal, it's really just a very thin wire that's seen and it's less noticeable than some of the custom products. So um, this slide is the, the hearing aid features and benefits um, and what the most important ones are, are on the bottom and it's we want them to be able to hear and be comfortable and quiet. So in a quiet situation at home, when you're just with one other person, the main goal is for that patient to be able to hear. Um, then we look at comfort and noise. We also want them to be able to hear when there's a lot of background noise. Uh, we want their speech intelligibility to be good when there's noise. And then there's a whole bunch of bells and whistles. And this is where we start to look at the technology. Hearing aids usually come in three different levels of technology. There's low level technology, there's mid level technology, and there's high end technology. Most of my patients are wearing mid level technology. They have good noise management for um, background noise in restaurant settings, but they're not paying for all these extra features that they don't need. The reason that we look at the lifestyle is where we consider these technology levels. Um, if I had a patient who was in their 80s or 90s and spent most of their day at home, I would probably give them a lower end technology. But if they're getting together in groups with their families, I might consider a mid-level. Um, I have a lot of patients now that are in their 50s and 60s and still working, and they want the bells and whistles. The nice thing is that with the newest technology, which is what we'll demo later, where you have the apps on your phone that stream to either an iPad or an iPhone, um, you can get those with the lowest level technology and have it still work. So you can still stream music or um, podcasts or whatever you want to hear, lectures for a college student. You could still stream that from an iPad or an iPhone, um, but you can do it without having to spend you know, high-end money on it, which is nice. It's become more easily accessible for people. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over some of the older styles of hearing aid technology. Again, just to kind of show you where we've come. There was conventional analog technology, which was around in the 90s. It was um, hearing aids that had a little screw, and that's how we would adjust the volume. We would use a screwdriver and we would use that little trim pot and make it louder or softer. Um, then they came out with a programmable analog which gave us a few little features and gave us some things like data logging on the computer. Um, it gave us a little bit more that we were able to do. And now everything is fully digital. So everything, uh, there's lots of chips inside the hearing aids and they're, they're all digital. Um, the main difference is that the batteries used to be much larger and now they've gotten much smaller. So hearing aid batteries typically only last about a week. A lot of the hearing aids now have rechargeable batteries. Um, so some patients choose to do that so that they're not changing little batteries once a week. Um, I have a few patients lately who have come to me that are blind and they've actually chosen to do the rechargeable batteries because it's easier. They just take them off and stick them in the little case and then take them out in the morning and put them on um, because the batteries have gotten much smaller to, to make the hearing aid smaller. Um, so some of the things that hearing aids can do for you is um, when you go the environmental classifier is in most hearing aids nowadays, and the hearing aids will automatically detect the sound around the patient and will adjust programs based on that. So it used to be that with a hearing aid, you would have a universal program 
And then you would have a program for noise or a program for TV or a program for in the car, you know, lots of different choices. Now most of them have their universal program that has five different memories. And depending upon the noise that it's picking up around you, it will automatically switch for you so you don't have to play with it. Um, along with that, they've become very smart. So they're now picking up the noise and turning it down. They also now work together so that when you um, are in a noisy situation, if the speaker is on your right side, it's detecting the um, steady state of the background on your left side and turning that down while detecting the differences in frequency on the right side and amplifying that so that you're hearing the speaker better against all the background noise. Um, so they, they really have come a very long way um, in a very short period of time. Um, this next slide has some of the accessories that you can get with hearing aids. So up in the top left corner is one of the chargers and it's a little square box and it shows the two hearing aids just sitting inside the charger. They typically charge in about six hours and you get 18 hours of use out of them. So you could wear them for a full day. Um, below that is another charger for two of the manufacturers, um, very similar. It's a little box and you put the two hearing aids in. And um, beside those is one that is a contained unit. So it has a lid that you would need to open and close when you put the batteries in. Um, there are microphones, which I'm wearing for someone. It's a little FM system. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, most of the manufacturers have a microphone so that if you're in a setting like this, a lecture or a college class, you can give the speaker the microphone and it's going directly to your hearing aids. Um, there is one that's meant for the TV. The nice thing about that is that you can turn off the background noise in the room so that you're only hearing the television and you're not getting distracted by everything else that's going on around you. Um, and then down on the bottom there are little necklaces that you would wear along with the hearing aids and this is how you used to connect the hearing aids to a phone or a tablet or something like that. Most of them that have come out now are um, just straight Bluetooth to the phones if you have an iPhone or an iPad. If you have an Android it's not the same and you still need to wear the necklace to get the direct streaming. But um, you can still access the app on the phone for volume control and program changes. And this slide shows the direct to iPhone hearing aids. Um, basically, it has hearing aids from five different manufacturers along with a picture of a cell phone. Each app is different. Um, so I have all of these here to show you. I was looking at it last night getting ready for this and there are definitely some apps that would be easier for someone who has um, blindness. Uh, some of the apps are much more user friendly and easier to use. So when you go see an audiologist, make sure you look at the apps. A lot of audiologists um, work with a certain manufacturer and you want to kind of know going in what options there are out there. Because is um, when I have a patient come into my office, my standard procedure, like I said, I spend usually an hour and a half with them, the first appointment, and I let them try out three or four different hearing aids because they all sound different. I have all of the hearing aids I have with me. I have five different hearing aids from five different manufacturers. They all have similar features in terms of technology. They all have great background noise management. They all connect to the iPhone. They all have multiple programs. Um, the main difference is how they sound, which is very important um, because even two patients with the same hearing loss may choose different hearing aids because they sound different. I have worn all of my hearing aids home and I know how they sound. Um, there are differences between them and some people like it one way more than another. So you want to make sure that you really are looking at multiple brands. Um, and then the apps are different, so you'll get a chance to take a look and see what might be easier um, for someone who has vision impairment. My, I have one patient who, like I said, is blind, um, and she wears a hearing aid on one ear, and she's using the um, Widex Beyond hearing aids, 
and she's doing very well with them. And it has been a life-changing thing for her and her husband. She just has seen me since the spring she came to see me. And she used to have it so that her phone was text-to-speech. And so anytime she went on Facebook or was watching something on YouTube, her husband had to listen to it. And now with the hearing aid, it's going directly to the hearing aid, and he doesn't hear any of it. And he's <laughs> very happy about that. Okay, so this is what we talked about, a little bit about the anatomy, um, how to read the audiogram, some of the effects of hearing loss, and then about hearing aids. Any questions? Do you, do you hear them? Okay. <laughs> My question is, I mean, Aaron's 37. He's been wearing hearing aids since he was 11. Mm -hmm. We've been very fortunate to be able to pay for really good hearing aids. Mm -hmm. um, there's always the concern when we're not around, and he doesn't have that kind of money. Right. Why, in all these years, for so many people who need hearing aids, why do insurances not pay for it? <laughs> that is a question I get asked all the time. And what can we do, even as a group, to maybe so pursue you can, that? So you can write to Congress. I know that there are hearing aid bills that have been put out there. Um, I don't know how far they've gotten in terms of that right now. Um, Elizabeth Warren supported one a couple, I think it was a year ago, um, for the over-the-counter hearing aids, which are not necessarily helpful. You still need to see an audiologist to get your hearing tested, and then they are not programmable. So you're going to spend a couple hundred dollars to buy these hearing aids over-the-counter, and that's what you have. They are not specific for your hearing loss. They are not in any way designed for you. Um, but there, I know there have been bills um, to try to get insurances to cover it. Mo some insurances are starting to. Um, as you start to begin to look at Medicare, make sure when you're looking at the supplemental plans that you go with a plan that has coverage. Um, Blue Cross and Tufts both provide, in Massachusetts I know this, I don't know about other places, but in Massachusetts, Blue Cross and Tufts both provide discounted programming. So I work with, it's a company called True Hearing, which is Blue Cross, and Hearing Care Solutions, which is Tufts, and they give discounted pricing. So for a hearing aid that I would charge $3,600 for, they're able to get it less expensively from the manufacturer because of deals that they have cut up with them. Um, and so they're able to offer it. I think one of my patients got two for $1,900. So it's still expensive, but not nearly the same cost. Um, and so even though it doesn't help me, like my, my goal with my practice, like I said before, is education. You know, I'm all about educating my patients, and that's why I take more time with them. And then also... Um, if they come in to me and they have these insurances, I tell them about these programs because I would rather see more people in hearing aids and hearing appropriately and protecting themselves from that word understanding going down than, you know, making another couple hundred dollars. Do they only cover certain hearing aids? No, you can you get can... them from most manufacturers and you can get the, um, the ones that do stream to the iPhones and the iPads. Okay, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah, I do have um, slightly more technical questions, but okay. um, I will ask them because I think they are very relevant for anyone here who has nori and hearing loss okay. and who is blind. Because the thing is that when you are wearing hearing aids and you're blind, and I don't wear one up to now, but I'm, I know from other people that there are some uh, technicalities that come into play. So first question is, is there any hearing aid at all that also amplifies sounds higher than 8,000 hertz? 
No, most uh, most hearing aids we only go out to eight thousand because that's what we're worried about with speech. Um, above eight thousand is when you would get into more of the music and things like that, which. You can have programs. Um, I was actually listening to music while I was working on my presentation last night through the hearing aids because mm -hmm. I was streaming them. And there are big differences between the hearing aids. So when you are going to look for hearing aids, ask them to test it out. I have sat with my patients and I've brought YouTube up on my computer and listened to different songs that they like so that they can really see how it sounds to them. Yeah, because of course... There goes the mic. Your mic is back. Well, anyway, uh, I'm also a music uh, producer and so on and so on. So the thing is, if I would lose everything above 8,000 hertz when I would do that, it would be very unfortunate. So at least in the streaming part, it would be nice if that would be preserved. And I think many uh, people here will be with me on that. So. Yeah. Uh, the, the music program, definitely, um, I know specifically for the one that I noticed the best difference with was the Widex one, and it had um, a more robust sound, and it tries to bring in more of the music. Obviously, they can't make it perfect, but they do do their best. Um, so definitely test out the music programs. So a lot of testing uh, there to do. Second question then is, um, how much control do we have over the compression and sound processing algorithms no control right now. <laughs> <laughs> but how much control do we have of the uh, sound processing algorithms that are at play in these hearing aids? Because of the fact that um, as a blind person, you are also orientating uh, yourself in your surroundings based on sound and about the reflections of the sound. And of course, I can imagine that noise reduction is very uh, important in hearing aids, but sometimes you also want the noise and you also want it to be as clean as possible because if you want to use something like echolocation or something like uh, orientation based on reverb and other characteristics, this is a problem because with any compression that would be applied, th this kind of information mm -hmm. gets uh, distorted. Absolutely. Um, so what I will say about that is that with the hearing aids, um, you want to find an audiologist that will work with you. Yeah. Um, I. I as a sound producer, music, musical producer, um, I have a lot of patients that are engineers and I love working with my engineers because I will let them come in and I will make a little change for them and see how it sounds and I will let them help me fine tune their hearing aids. So find an audiologist that will work with you. But then with the apps, you do have some controls. Some of them are very good at giving you access to the bass, the mid, and the treble and lets you adjust them a little bit on your own. Mm -hmm. Overall, when you get a hearing aid, the way that it's programmed is how I program it, but then you do have some control with these apps to the volume um, on one side versus the other. In mm -hmm. both ears, you have the mid, the bass, and the treble. Some of the newest ones that just came out, um, the Widex Evoke, has a program now similar to what you would do if you were having your glasses um, adjusted where it gives you an A versus B comparison. So if you listen to A mm -hmm. and it sounds better than B, you would make a note of that and then it will change how the hearing aid is functioning based upon your preferences. Yeah. But there is no way for us to uh, access the technicalities and to really go into you know threshold levels, attacks, releases, noise filters and all these uh, Only things. if you find an audiologist that will allow you to do that. Okay, so I will have to search for that then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, last uh, question, sorry for all the questions, but yeah. last question concerns the streaming with Bluetooth uh, specifically towards phones. One of the major problems that blind people are facing with headphones is that Bluetooth has a latency to it. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, if you want to use voiceover, this latency <laughs> is highly annoying because then it means that the, when you are uh, executing a command on voiceover, it lasts half a second before this command actually gets through your, to your ears, which is highly annoying. The question is then, is there any solution right now already, or one in the making, that's using low latency Bluetooth uh, functionality, because it exists? So I think that these are using the low latency Bluetooth. Um, I believe that there, some of them use Bluetooth, but then some of them have their own connections as well from mm. the manufacturer. Um, I have not heard from any of my patients that they've had this problem. Uh, obviously, they don't all have the, the vision impairment as well. Um, but I know I have plenty of them that use like ways through their um, for driving through their hearing aids, and they don't complain about any sort of a, a delay. 
Yeah, but it's, it's very subtle. So uh, I, I know from other Nori patients that almost every one of them complains about it. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, it can be a problem. I do know I have a patient who um, complains about it cutting out. Sometimes one ear will cut out and she'll only hear yeah, through yeah, one okay. ear and things like that. So there is obviously a problem yeah. with Bluetooth, but it's much better that they have it than that they don't. For me, uh, my conclusion is simple. Nothing better than the good old jack plug. <laughs> There's no lid, no. and also the mics don't fall out when the signal is gone. <laughs> anyway, those were my questions. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. I think I've got no. I got on. Yes. Um, okay. So Nori, a lot of it is hearing loss that's progressive. Yes. And as an audiologist, how do you handle or and you probably haven't had this come to you yet, but how would you proceed to handle? The idea that okay it's no longer time for hearing aids they're not effective it's now time to do an implant so I actually have had something like that happen I had a gentleman who came to see me through one of the Medicare supplemental insurance programs um, he was 88 uh, and his hearing when I tested his word understanding he was only at 30 percent and I would not sell him a hearing aid it would have provided him no benefit he tried it in my office and there was no benefit and I told him at 88 it's difficult because they probably won't do a cochlear implant on him, but if I came across a patient, I would absolutely refer you to one of the cochlear implant centers. Um, I know in Boston you can have it done at Mass Eye and Ear. Um, I know Children's, I think, might have one, um, but I don't know if that's just for kids. So I, I would definitely refer you out to a cochlear implant center. Yeah. Hi there. Um, you mentioned there was an app for um, was it iPhones mm -hmm. where you can monitor the um, decibels. Do you have any names you can give us? Uh, so the one that I use personally on my phone, I've tried out a few different ones. The one that I use is called Noise Capture, um, and it works really well. It's nice because it also has a recording. So I had one patient who came to me because he was losing his hearing because of work-related issues. And they would send him out with a dosimeter only on the days that he was in the office. So on the days that he was working in the turbines at the natural gas station, I would I gave him this because he could record the sound levels. Um, and it's it's been fairly accurate. I use it at concerts and things like that. Um, and it's called Noise Capture. It's on my Android, so I think you can get it on both Android and iPhone. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. You have one too. Yeah. There are lots of them out there. Some of them aren't necessarily accurate in terms of volume, though. Um, one of the other ones that I had had on mine first was not providing the, the right amount of volume out there. So I don't know if there's a way to calibrate it. If there is, then I would definitely recommend that. Um, but I found that this one works pretty well. Any other questions? Um, I don't, is it on? Yep. Oh, because, okay, now I hear myself. Um, yeah, I have a question. I have a pair of Resound hearing aids. Um, had them for a couple years. Um, so I noticed that when I'm connected to my iPhone, they, uh, they cut out a lot. So, like, basically, got them connected to my iPhone. I don't experience the Bluetooth delay at all, and I do use voiceover, and it works fine. But my phone disconnects from the resound hearing aids like all the time uh and it's really a pain um but i mean i don't know if there's any like firmware uh. so there are firmware updates that come out every once in a while with the newer resound hearing aids i believe you get the updates um when you go to start up the app but my suggestion for that i've had a lot of patients like i was before that have had some issues with it cutting out mm. and um, people don't shut their phones off quite as often as they used to. And sometimes if you run the iOS updates on the iPhones, if you don't shut your phone off, it causes problems between the hearing aid and the phone. So okay. my recommendation is maybe every couple of weeks, just shut your phone down for five minutes and let it kind of get a little break. And when you turn it back on, they tend to have better connections with the Bluetooth. I don't know what the I, I don't know why it does that. I know I have a similar issue with Facebook on my phone 
-hmm. where if I don't shut my phone off every once in a while, Facebook just doesn't work anymore. Um, so I recommend trying to turn your phone off and then restarting it after about five minutes and hopefully the connection issues won't be there. Okay, and then I have one more question. Um, so I noticed that they came out with some um, batteries called Z Power, yep. um, and they're rechargeable. And what you do is basically go to your audiologist's office and be like, "Hey, I want these rechargeable batteries," and um, they switch out your door. And um, <clears throat> I was wondering, do the resound uh, aids the links uh, squared? Are they able to do the rechargeable batteries, or are they only available on the resound links 3D? Um, that I will look up for you. I can, I can look that up very quickly on my phone. I believe that the link squared are rechargeable, but I don't want to make that guarantee. So I will look that up for you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That's it. <clears throat> yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Here I am again. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's okay. I'm back. With another question, actually uh, very personal this time, because one of my greatest fears with hearing aids and my specific case of Nori is that not only do I have the fact of hearing loss, but I also have the impression that the golden rules for uh, you know noise exposure do not apply to me. Because I am a DJ, I go to festivals sometimes, I wear custom molded earplugs, I tried six or seven different brands, usually with 25 dB filters. Mm -hmm. And even when I am on festivals with 25 dB filters, and I can also, um, I can also see it when I'm in noise environments of like 75, 80 dB, whatever, um, even for one hour if I get out of them, I feel that there's something going on, uh, this typical threshold value, uh, yeah, displacement kind of. Uh, so yeah, I can I can feel that something is going on with my ears and that it wasn't good for them, even with a, a lot lower exposure to a lot noise. And um, yeah, one of the things that I'm scared about is, and I guess the answer will be again, find another audiologist that will work with you. But one of the things that I'm scared about is that this these hearing aids might input a little too much noise that might be, you know, in the long term damaging my ear even more. So do you have, do you have hearing loss? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. So what they would do is they would program it so that it was set up for you. Um, yeah. If you got into a situation where it was too noisy, there are usually mute functions. We could even mm -hmm. maybe for some of them put the button on the hearing aid, you could hit it and it would mute them. Yeah. Um, However, they're set to not give you more than you need. So when we yeah. program them, we're giving you just the volume to bring you up to like a normal hearing mm -hmm. level. Um, but there are output limiters so that we yeah. can set it so that you're not getting too loud. I guess, and then there is also going to be some uh, long-term requirement, uh, long-term te testing required to see what my volume would be and if it's not. Absolutely. So you should really have your hearing tested every one to two years to make sure it's not changing. And especially yeah. if you're wearing hearing aids, you should have it tested. Um, but with the with the concerts, I know you are um, a DJ and, and you're very musically in tuned. And so the musician's plugs are really absolutely a good fit for you. But if you're going to be really close to a speaker, you might want to consider just a solid plug because you'll get it, it will make things more bassy, but you will get more sound protection. Mm -hmm. So you might want to have a solid pair that you can put on in a situation where you might be exposed to a louder level of sound. Yeah, well, I have a lot of different types of them, so okay. I'll try them. Thank you. Yeah. All right, guys. So Darcy has a table set up here with um, five different aids that we can demo and. Of course, it'll be small groups at a time, but um, feel free to take a break, use the restroom, check the Darcy, ask some questions. Um, all right. Thanks.